Well, this is going to be a presentation of two halves. The first bit's uh, reflecting on sort of issues I've been thinking about uh, for the past six or seven years. Um, it's been a journey like several others have uh, discussed. Um, a journey that took me, uh, when I first started in archaeology as a scientist, a bachelor of science, I was very impressed at the time, my mum loved that, and to a point where now I very much see what we do and what we represent is part of the arts, cultural and heritage sector more broadly. So what I'll do in this presentation is uh, do a first part that has you know, some thoughts, some issues I'm trying to work through uh, about Oh, excuse me. Oh, well, Somebody should have shouted out. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, what it represents uh, in terms of what I'm trying to work through. There's a second part that is um, slightly more free form, which is about just some images that I have compiled of works and pieces I've been exploring. Um, so let's get started properly. Um, yeah, I'm going to think about archaeological traditions. I mean, I think some fundamental issues about, you know, why we think we do what we do and how we do it. Uh, many of you will be aware of an interesting emergent strand about intersections between art and archaeology. We'll briefly reflect on that. I do want you to think about the archaeological encounter and what that might mean to you, and more importantly, what that might mean to others who we don't allow the archaeological encounter. And then I want you to start thinking about archaeological activation. What might that mean? How might you do it? How might others activate archaeologically? And then we'll come to the kind of overarching theme that, as others have already mentioned this morning, that archaeology is fundamentally creative. And what is it to us potentially if we embrace creativity at the core of our practices? So let's start exploring. Um, we are hidden by the shadow of earlier traditions. Our attempt to illuminate in different ways, to uh, make some sense not only of the past but of where we occupy in the present, um, is one of the tensions that I think is, is fundamental to us in our sector. Um, you know, the sector does great stuff, but it is locked in mindsets that take us back to kind of antiquarian models of fetishistic obsessions with objects, through to uh, a client obsessed, technocratic. Uh, work machine that processes archaeological deposits as quickly as possible. Now, I'm being a bit unfair here, but there are fundamental issues about where we find ourselves today and how that uh, creates lenses of how we practice. But things have changed in the past. You know, we can look at those broad traditions of archaeological practice and they will and should change again. Now, one of the areas where there's been interesting work is the broader kind of um, shall we say community based practices, but archaeology absolutely opened up to all in different ways. This wonderful image of Petter, who I hope is here on a hillside in the highlands of Scotland, is a project that's been instigated and run by a group of MacGregors, a uh, clan Gregor, who come from all over the world. And their sense of what this represents, the values that articulate through this, is not simply archaeological knowledge production, as many of you will know who work in that part of the sector. Um, and that conversation we have with that moment of encounter articulates through other forms of funding like landscape partnership schemes and longer term, more programmatic approaches that allow an outcome focused rather than output focused approach to transform the way we practice. Uh, playful little interventions of, you know, um, uh, kind of experience through presencing through those costumes or evoking the events of Major General William Roy. 200 years earlier, who had a major impact on the um, effectively colonial conquest of the Highlands, shall we say. So this playfulness, there is deeper sort of resonance is running beneath it. And again, the work that happens in many, many parts of the sector. This case again uh, was working with drug and alcohol recovery uh, uh, service users and put their experience at the heart of it and the outcomes they were trying to achieve. And there was a reference to the deeper time depths of landscape representation through visual artists from the late 18th and 19th century. The conventions we still see landscape through, the picturesque and the sublime, the things we take for granted when we talk about design gardens and landscapes and the values we assign to them are riddled with the sensibilities of the 18th century. So, and the real dividend we have just now, that digital turn that we can transform and mediate materials in ways that we couldn't have imagined. 
So this case here is about the story of an Iron Age hill fort down in the part of the landscape partnership scheme, a tricephalous head, wonderful, rich and symbolic uh, resource that was scanned and 3D printed and then moulds created. So the point being, input-output models are something in that creative process that we can start to embrace as well. So I suppose what I'm trying to say in this case is there is lots to be optimistic about and lots to be hopeful about. And some of that creativity, some of that energy is coming through this kind of conversations taking place about art and archaeology. Uh, for those of you who haven't started to explore it, um, the a fairly recent journey of the Journal of the uh, Journal of Contemporary Archaeology has got a kind of special edition that we're well worth looking at. And uh, that really sums up some papers that came through in the 2015 EAA session on creative archaeology. So there's been a couple of sessions about creative archaeology that's been more practice led. And, and I think you know, it goes to some of the points that Neil made, which is if we position our view about what we do, what we produce, and why we do it in that kind of cultural production context, it changes the way we have to practice. Uh, and the real thing about it is two, well, two things. One, it's the space between. It's not trying to be simply an artist or simply an archaeologist. There's something interesting happens in the spaces between that we either don't occupy for whatever reasons, or the spaces that we can uh, uh, claim these other territories. And most importantly, it gives, like all of us, a chance to play and experiment. You know, have fun. It doesn't really matter when you create if it's not perfect, if it goes wrong. Those are the mistakes and things that really make the difference. So archaeological encounters is quite simple. The most powerful experience we've all had, potentially. The first moment you revealed your shirt of Vika pottery, or the first moment you saw that thumbprint on a medieval green glaze pot. You'll have your moments. And it changes the way you probably see the world in different ways. But the way our system is configured now, 90% of the archaeology that's excavated, we do not allow that encounter to anybody else bar ourselves. And I think us acting as facilitator curators with those unique encounters could be really powerful. And in that sense, one of those lies Neil was talking about is the idea that pastness is not back there, that pastness is not some temporally deep in that sense. It's about that encounter, it's about the moment of mediation. So, and by that means we are never neutral. So the Scara Bray, you'll know it well. It's not simply an archaeological site, it is a site that is uh, in threat of coastal erosion, with the deep and significant change that's taken place in our planet. Adjacent to it in Caithness, Kildonan landscape, uh, a chambered cairn there that was dug into and gold was found. Gold that was then stimulus for the and gold, gold rush. And the deer skull that was found up there is uh, that story of the wilderness of overgrazed uplands in Scotland. So archaeological activations, that moment if you change your stance about creatively energising and chanting, intervening in the world in some way through that encounter, and allowing people that process could be potentially very important. So, really, rethinking excavation is the next thing I will come to. Not today, and not in the next few weeks, but I think that's the area that we need to do more in that. I think I was going to talk about that. Imagining things differently. So, on my journey, this is the second part, started with stone sculpture about 10 years ago uh, for a variety of reasons. And this assemblage of pieces does represent uh, a sensibility. And working with found objects and playing when you're in the landscape, uh, assembling the Chabot de Frise on an Iron Age hill fort in uh, uh, the borders of Scotland is another dimension. Found objects on the beach, the Anthropocene world we exist, you know, the archaeologies of the contemporary is something I think gives an empowerment and ways that activation. And here in this case, in the west coast of Scotland, an assemblage of glass and ceramics laid simply in a way I'll let you judge whether it has any presence. The sea will reclaim it, redistribute it, we can't control it, but it exists in its own terms. And then, the play of lights and sounds, moments of light painting, clave occurrence, a night of quiet and contemplation. Aaron, Macri Moore, can we evoke a different sense, a different place? So yes, there's been moments where we've taken it further. I've worked with others, a colleague, uh, Kenny Brophy, on the Build and Burn approach, and we've curated performances now in a way that that creative intersection is very much about 
an experience, an immersive experience. The build, the play with materials, the learning about materiality, and the immersiveness of a past that may never have been. The sounds of taiko drummers on the hillside will haunt me forever. Not authentic, but it had an integrity when they pulled those drums up. Another piece, among the dead dunes, some trees glow like the sun. The amber on Baltic shores, a piece in Lithuania where my concern was with the deep time, the environmental impacts of sea level changes through thousands of years in the Baltic. The hot glow of the ant's nest, the force of nature and energy, the found objects gathered and assembled. And then a simple intervention, backlit amber on a beach, the hot glow of the sun millions of years ago. An ancient tree to the veterans and woodlands, our biocultural heritage, other forms of being, an archaeology of the biological, interventions for an environmental arts festival, things that befell us in those strange years, words of a 19th century writer, Samuel Crockett, who knew that landscape of the uplands only too well. And the fragments of his text relate to specific places, the surprise of finding them, the moments of juxtaposition, places seen and heard differently, perhaps, through an intervention. 19th century railways forced into the landscape. These are all the place names that you would pass through as you hurt along the train. The train line was removed in the late 20th century, but we reappropriated it. The viaduct, the names were placed on, created the rhythms of the train line. Significant place, but others lurk in the woodlands. Medieval, later rural settlements, probably never visited in 1700 years. Bodden's Folly. That was the name that was given to them. We have but a moment in the flow of time, another piece where axe, waste working fragment from the Langdales fell out of the archaeological system. And now 30 of these boxes are circulating for five years with individuals who have been asked to respond creatively to them. Crag the Calic Axe Factory in the Highlands of Scotland, Langdale axe fragments carried there and arranged. It's not literal. and the silence of empty spaces. Again, the flow country, Caithness, a wilderness perhaps, the seven days I walked across there, and encountered life forms and places, an absence of people, the cleared houses. The Bothies left as if only yesterday, names scratched upon the wall from the 1920s. I could hear the story still as people sat there sharing their fare. An ombre filled with cotton grass, a ghost-like suggestion. And then those traces, particles, through the air, through the water. We might not even see them. But sometimes we can refocus, draw attention. Ships rivets found in the uplands and our oxide taken down to the shore. Perhaps the boat had been built there. And then the nails from the shoreline taken up to the loch and rearranged. They then became sculptural pieces for an exhibition. <coughs> the flight, the moment of sitting, of contemplation. Poetry, photography, sculptural pieces combined. Probably going to run a little bit over if that's okay. Sorry. The recent piece up at Maybra, deep prehistories, mythogeographies. What fragments of picturesque views can be found? Abbey 1790 was the pattern form. It was sold to a company in the Netherlands. And now modern detritus can be found still. Is it an IKEA plate? I couldn't find the print and the base. 
But a simple collage along the surface potentially transforms it, at least draws our attention to it in different ways. And I had to perform. The oak branch from Maybra, a found object, redolent, full of symbolism, King Arthur's round table nearby, the flight of a bird, all those moments captured in a circular monument. And then my walking wands. They travelled from Maybra to Long Meg and her daughters. A simple enchantment, a conceit, but those sticks will never be the same again. They've travelled 5,000 years. So what things lurk when you look differently? What things can be found from those objects, from those moments you can assemble, you can create? Time will tell. Thank you very much.